Well, good morning, everyone. So nice that you can be with us here today for uh, a Sunday service. And I just want to say a huge welcome to those watching from home um, through our BBC Connect platform. You know, one thing I realized and I'm so happy about is no matter what's going on around us, uh, it, won't take it won't take church away from us, isn't it? We can still do church. Um, and uh, this morning, we hope that our worship will be an encouragement to you and that uh, we will have the strength to carry on as we should. Um, I'm going to do uh, the call to worship, and I'm reading from Psalm 27. Would you please stand with us for the call to worship? And it reads, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Let's sing together. Blessed be your name. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see. I don't know about you, but when I've been in those difficult situations when, when all my friends were nowhere to be seen, that's when I found that I felt the presence of the Lord more. And I just think during this time when there's so much anxiety around and everybody's not sure about what the future will hold, this is the time that we need to draw closer to the Lord. And uh, this is the time that you can say, Abba, Father, Hold me close. Let your love surround me. Bring me near and draw me to your side. And church, we just, we just want to encourage you today that no matter what's going on around us, it will never take the presence of the Lord away from us. Let's sing it together one more time. Right. 
rise up like the eagle, and I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on in the power of your love, and I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on in the power.
let's just close in a word of prayer before Darren comes up and preaches. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God that we can run to. You are the God that we can lean on, that draws us close and holds us in the good and the bad, in the ups and downs of life. Uh, you are eternal, you are constant, you are sure, and we can lean on that and know that uh, there is nothing that will shake us if we hold close to you. Yeah. Father, be with Darren now as he comes up and preaches. Uh, speak through him. Uh, use the time that he has put in to preparing the sermon to teach us and to show us more of you. Guide him, give him wisdom, give him the words to speak as we listen to him now. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. It's great to see each of you uh, this morning. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us via our BBC Connect platform at home. We're sorry that this is coming to you late. We had a technical glitch in our first meeting this morning, uh, so hope that you can be patient and bear with us at home. But so glad that you can join us uh, on site, uh, online, and we praise God that we can gather together as His church wherever we may be, uh, not just around the city, but I know there are people tuning in around the world. So great to have you join us. Um, thank you to the song and music team. Really appreciate the guys. It's a long day for our team when they serve on a Sunday. Uh, so thanks to Evans and the guys that you saw up here. We've got Sean Martin at our uh, sound desk, and we've got Russ Smith up at Easy Worship. Really appreciate you guys. I want to say thanks to uh, Sheila Miller. She's responsible. Aren't these uh, flowers beautiful? So she's responsible for these flowers. A few weeks back, I wasn't sure who was responsible for the um, variety of pot plants that were down at the bottom here. I since discovered that that was uh, Maureen Hundermark, so a huge thank you uh, to Maureen for that. And thank you for being patient with us uh, as we go through these precautionary measures of COVID-19. It can sometimes be frustrating, but we want to be smart and we want to be careful as possible. We also want to be sure that we comply with the regulations that have been given to us as churches. So as a leadership, we keep our ear to the ground, we keep our finger on the pulse uh, just with what's going on around about us. If ever we feel that it's necessary for us to pull back and to all return to um, online church, uh, the leadership will make that decision. But we're here today, um, and you're with us at home, and it's great that we can continue to worship our Lord. So regardless of what comes, these things will not stop us. Amen. Okay. Uh, I want to say a huge shout out uh, via our video camera this morning to um, Maureen Elliott. Maureen celebrated on the 11th of July. She celebrated her 88th birthday. Isn't that fantastic? So a uh, happy birthday to Maureen. And then John and Maureen celebrated this past Thursday, the 16th of July. They celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary. So uh, why don't we give them a round of applause? They're not here, but they'll pick it up on camera. And uh, John and Maureen, the Lord bless you guys. We thank, you. We thank the Lord for you. We uh, are so grateful for the witness of your lives and your love for one another. 65 years of marriage. What an example to us. And the Lord bless you in the seasons still to come. Well, why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 10 this morning um, as we continue our series in the book of Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, we're going to continue where we uh, left off couple of weeks back, and as you're turning there, a huge thank you to Anthony Gunning for sharing God's Word uh, with us last week, and I'm very grateful for him stepping into the pulpit in all three of our meetings. So just a quick recap of what we've looked at uh, so far. So we started out in 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, where the children of Israel turn around and they say to Samuel, uh, give us a king just like all the other nations. And in doing that, what they were doing is they were rejecting God as their king. They were rejecting Yahweh as their king. As the story unfolds, we find that God is loving and God is kind and God is faithful. And everything plays out in the hands of a sovereign God. So a couple of weeks back, we looked at how um, God still provided a king for the children of Israel, even though they had rejected him. It is God who chooses Saul to serve and to lead his people. We talked about how a couple of weeks ago, there is never a time when God is not working. God is always working in the detail of our lives. God works in the good times and God works in the bad times. 
God works in the valleys and God works on the mountaintops. God works in the times of desperation and God works in the times of celebration. There is never a time when God is not working. We talked about the providence of God. We talked of how providence means that God has not neglected or forsaken the world that He has created, but rather God is working within that created order according to His sovereign will, according to His divine counsel, and according to His loving intention for the good of His people and ultimately for the glory of His name. And so as we come to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, the title of the message this morning is The Faithful King. The Faithful King. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads as we pray together. Our God and our Father, as we come together this morning, whether we be on site or online, what a privilege for us to be able to gather together as the church of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your kingship in and over your church. Thank you for your unfailing love toward us. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness through the generations. And Lord, as we come to your word this morning, I ask that you would make our eyes to see and our ears to hear, our minds to understand, Lord, and our hearts to receive your word this morning. And Father, we might prove by experience that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And Lord, I pray that I would be nothing, for I am nothing, and that my Lord, you would be everything. For you are everything. To the praise of your glorious, wonderful, beautiful, outrageous, and scandalous grace to people like us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're in First Samuel chapter 10. There's a chunk we're going to look at, but I'm only going to read little bits of Scripture, and then we'll pull it together as we go along. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to First Samuel 10, and we're going to start from verse 17. I'm coming out of the new King James Version this morning, but you follow with me. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, starting from verse 17, we're going to read 17 to, to 21 to start with. The Word of God reads as follows, Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. If we go... Down to uh, verse 24, uh, the Word of God uh, reads as follows, And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? And so all the people shouted and said, Long live the king! And then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house, and Saul also went home to Gabeah, and valiant men went with them whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, how can this man save us? So they despised him, and they brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Chapter 11, verse 1. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition I will make a covenant with you, that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach to all of Israel. And then the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel, and then if there is no one to save us, we will come running to you. In verse 4 of chapter 11, So the messengers came to Gabeah of Saul and told the news and the hearing of the people, and all the people lifted up their voices and they wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field, and he said, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. And then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard, the, heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. Verse 11, And so it was on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch, and they killed the Ammonites until the heat of the day. 
And it happened that those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Verse 12, then the people said to Samuel, who is he who said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. The heart of the message this morning, church, and I've often said this from the pulpit, it's simple and yet it's true, is that in spite of our unfaithfulness, God remains faithful. Amen, church? In spite of our unfaithfulness, God remains faithful. So we ended last time with Samuel anointing Saul as king. As we come to uh, the text this morning, we find Samuel gathering the people together. And what he starts out doing, God says to Samuel, he says, I want you to remind the people of a few things. I want you to remind them that I am the God who brought them out of Egypt. I want you to remind them that I am the God who, who rescued them from slavery. I want you to remind them that I am the God who has been good and who has been faithful and who has been merciful and gracious and kind to them throughout the generations. I want you to remind them of these things. And having reminded them of these things, the Word of God says this of the children of Israel. Even though I'm a faithful God, you have rejected your God who himself saved you from all your adversities and your tribulations, and you turn around and you said, no, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. And so the Bible tells us that Samuel gets all the people together and he gets the tribe of Benjamin to step forward. And once the tribe of Benjamin steps forward, he gets the family of Matri to step forward. And then from the family of Matri, he calls uh, the son of Kish, uh, Saul, to himself. And he presents uh, Saul to the people. He says, here's the king that you asked for. This is the king that God has chosen for you. The people turn around and they shout out with a loud voice, long live the king. This is what we've been asking for. We asked for a king who would take care of us, and God's given us that king. But the Bible tells us towards the end of uh, chapter 10 that there were some skeptics who turned around, some rebels turned around and said, how can this man save us? But the Bible says that Saul held his peace and did not bring harm upon them. And I want you to remember that question, how can this man save us? And so as we open chapter 11, no sooner had Saul's uh, rule begun than uh, trouble came to the children of Israel. It comes to the town of Jabesh Gilead, which lay about 40 k south of the Sea of Galilee. And there was a guy by the name of Nahash. He was the commander of the Ammonites. The Ammonites were descendants of Lot. And the Ammonites for a long time had been a thorn in the flesh uh, of the children of Israel. And so Nahash, the commander, funny his name actually, Nahash means serpent or snake. And, and, he, and he lived up to, uh, to the character of a snake or a serpent. And so Nahash, the commander, has besieged the city of Jabesh Gilead, surrounds the city, and threatens to bring destruction to them. But the Bible tells us that uh, as, as this news reaches the people in Jabesh Gilead, we've got to ask ourselves this question, what, how do they respond? Do they cry out to God? No. Do they cry out to Saul, their newly appointed king? No. What do they do? The first thing they want to do is they want to surrender. First thing they want to do is they want to enter into covenant with a pagan nation. So here we're talking about in church, I want us to see this. We're going to see the regression. We're going to see the downward spiral of an unfaithful people, but God remains faithful. The children of Israel are God's covenant people, and yet here we see them wanting to make covenant with a pagan nation. And so their solution is to surrender to the Ammonites. And so Nahash turns around and says, he says, we can strike a covenant. He says, there's only one condition. He says that I pluck out the right eye of every single one of you. And the whole reason that he wants to do this is he wants to bring reproach upon, upon the children of Israel. He wants them to be an utter disgrace. But not only that, he knows that if he can pluck out their right eye, that it will render them incapable of ever being able to come against the Ammonites in war and being successful. And so he says, I want to pluck out the right eye of every single one of you. 
He wanted to humiliate God's people. And so in chapter 11 and verse 3, Then the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days, that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then if there is no one to save us, then we will come out to you. These guys had God as their king, but they rejected him. They demanded a king, and God gave them a king, and yet still they did not turn to this king in their time of need, in their time of trouble. They asked for a a tangible king. They wanted to be able to see this king. They wanted to be able to see this king go before them, this king who would fight for them. That's why they rejected God. God gave them a king, and they still don't cry out to this king. These guys are just not sure of what they want, right? Does that sound familiar? Sound like someone you know? Sound like us? Okay. And so they turn around and they say to Naash, give us seven days, and we'll see if we can find someone who can save us. You see the downward spiral. They were God's covenant people, yet they wanted to make covenant with the pagan nation. God saved them. And yet they turned around and said, give us seven days, and we're going to see if someone can save us. How tragic is that? They had God as their king who saved them from slavery, who saved them from bondage, who saved them through the, uh, through the crossing of the Red Sea, who saved them in the wilderness. He had saved them through the ages. They had the record of the faithfulness of God, and yet they turned around and said, Hold out, give us seven days, and we'll find someone who can save us. And yet it was God who had saved them. We must laughing because it's, it's crazy, isn't it? Right? It's ridiculous. That was their attitude. And so, uh, so then news gets to Gabeah of Saul. So this is Saul's area now. And when the people hear about it, they, they're in Saul's area. Do they go searching for Saul? No, they don't. What do they do? They just start weeping and wailing and making a whole lot of noise, right? And then as Saul's coming from the land, he hears this noise. He's coming uh, coming behind the herd from the field, and he says, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. So I just want to point something out here. As I said a couple of weeks ago, Saul doesn't turn out to be a great king, and we're going to learn that, okay? We probably see him at his best in this chapter. So Saul has already been anointed by Samuel as king, but we don't see him sitting at home and expecting people to just dance around him and to serve him. He's still serving alongside his men in the, in the fields. Right, now bear in mind, his coronation ceremony hasn't happened yet. It happens after this account. But he has already been told by Samuel that God has anointed you as king. And so it's pretty admirable at this point in his life, the humility that we see that even though he had been anointed king, he did not think it below himself to still go out to the land and to work alongside his people. This is the best we're ever going to see of Saul. It just gets worse from here. But at this point, let's give him credit where credit is due. And so he hears the predicament of Jabesh Gilead. And here's what, he said, here's what the Bible says, Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. And so he took a yoke of oxen and he cut them in pieces and he sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of the messengers, saying this to them, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they all came together with one consent. The church, I want us to understand something here. When the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon, uh, upon Saul, What the Scriptures want us to understand is this. Everything that was about to happen in this account would be the result of God and not the result of of Saul. Everything that was about to happen in this battle was to be a result of the Spirit of God that came upon Saul, the Spirit of God that enabled and empowered and equipped Saul for the task at hand. The Bible wants us to understand none of this was the work of man, and all of this was the work of God. That's what it means. So when the Spirit of God came upon Saul, God took this man who wasn't quite fit for the task, and his spirit made him fit for the task. Have you guys got that? So that at the end of the day, it's going to be clear who the hero of the story is. 
And so Saul gathers together 330,000 men, and the word is sent out. Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. And then the messengers came, and they reported it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. And therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do with us whatever seems good to you. And so it was on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch, and they killed the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered, so that no two of them were left together. Who gave the victory? It was God. To a people who were unfaithful, to a people who said, you stand back, God. We want our own king. And yet God shows himself as the faithful king. I don't know about you, but as I look at the, the seasons of my life, there are seasons that have been marked and tainted by unfaithfulness. Seasons where I've made my own plans and seasons when I've wandered away from God, but God has remained faithful. Can any of you else, can anyone else testify to that? Where we've been unfaithful, but God is the faithful king. In fact, I came across a quote actually early hours this morning by Charles, Swin, uh, Charles Spurgeon, and he said this, he said, the glory of God's faithfulness is that no sin of ours has ever made him unfaithful. Isn't that beautiful? The glory of God's faithfulness is that no sin of ours has ever made God unfaithful. No sin of ours has ever made God retaliate. No sin of ours has ever made God play at our game. God always remains faithful. And so the Lord gives victory to His people in spite of their unfaithfulness. Even though they had rejected Him, God refused to reject His people. God continued to love them and care for them and nurture them and sustain them, and God continued to fight for and defend His people. And so after this great victory, there are a bunch of people in this army who think they're bigger than life itself. And they turn around and they say, hey, hang on a minute. Weren't there a bunch of people who asked the question, how can this man save us? They all want to be the glory boys, right? We're the good guys who went out and fought. There are a bunch of people who turn around and ask the question, how can this man save us? Let's get a hold of these guys and let's put them to death. They're just out to impress Saul, right? And we think that Saul would rush in there and that he would put these guys to death. But we see a sense of humility. Saul turned around and says, not a man shall be put to death this day. Why? For today, the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. In fact, this is the smartest thing you're ever going to hear Saul say. <laughs> okay, he won't say anything smarter than this. It just gets dumb from here on out. Okay, but this is the smart thing he says. He says, we're not putting anyone to death. He says, because that victory wasn't the result of 330,000 men. He says, that victory was because God is faithful. And so we can only admire him at this point in time. He realizes that his victory over the Ammonites had nothing to do with him and everything to do with Yahweh. And as a result of this victory, the people are now enthusiastic to gather around and to uh, see the coronation ceremony of Saul. And then Samuel said to the people, come Let's go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal, and there they made sacrifices and peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. But I want to point out once again the regression here. So these men start out, and they have, they're in covenant with God, and they say, you know what? We want covenant with another. They have a God who saves them, and they turn around and say, we're going to find a God who, we're going to find someone who will save us. They have a God who fights their battles for them, and yet they turn around and they want to take the glory for themselves. But God still remains faithful to his people. The story in chapter 11 and verse 1 starts out all doom and gloom as the Ammonites come around Jabesh Gilead. 
but it ends with the people rejoicing greatly. Why? Because God is a faithful king. They were God's covenant people. And even though they forgot it, God did not forget it. And church, I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that even when I am unfaithful, God remains faithful. That even when I forget God, God never, ever forgets me. Are you grateful for that? I was reminded, and it only struck me in this meeting, not in the first one. Um, I've forgotten the words now, but the one song that we were singing um, about God's faithfulness. First time I heard that song was the first Sunday uh, Cassandra and I were in this church as a pastoral couple. And I knew that we were here because God had called us from Kodoma, but that particular Sunday, my heart was burdened because I felt for the congregation back in Kodoma Baptist Church. But I remember as we were singing that song, God saying to me, Darren, I'll be faithful to you and Cassandra, and I will be faithful to my church, KBC. And God is still faithful to this day. And so as we were singing, the, the Lord reminded me, remember the day you stood here nine years ago, and I reminded you of my faithfulness. He's our faithful king. And friends, as we come to a close this morning, I want to remind you that God loves us passionately and He pursues us relentlessly and He cherishes us jealously and He cares for us faithfully. I'm going to say that again. God loves us passionately. He pursues us relentlessly. He cherishes us jealously and He cares for us faithfully. The question we've got to ask ourselves is this. Is there any unfaithfulness in our hearts? Have we turned our hearts to, to another? Have we placed our confidence and our trust in another? I'm sure you'll all agree with me that we're living in uncertain times, aren't we? And sometimes that can cause us to, to go wandering and go looking for some kind of plan. And if we are unfaithful or have been unfaithful in any way, then we need to repent and confess and seek God's forgiveness. The Bible says some will trust in horses and some will trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Is He your King? Do we live with Him as our King? Do our actions show that He is our King? Our king. And I just want to say this, if you're here this morning or if you're watching at home, and if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, friends, I want to tell you that the greatest honor that God bestows upon a man, woman, boy, or girl is to dare to call us children of His kingdom, to make us children of His kingdom. We're not children of this world. This is a fast-fading world. If, you've, if you haven't figured it out, this world's in a mess, right? But the greatest honor He bestows he bestows is to call us children of his kingdom. And if you don't know Jesus, will you, will you make a decision to know him today? As you repent of your, of your sin, as you confess of your sin, as you declare him as Lord, so he will save you. But it doesn't stop there. Then the Bible teaches we get involved in his church and we start to live a life that honors and pleases him. In spite of our unfaithfulness, God remains faithful. He is the, the only faithful king. And so with that, as the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from all evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Listen, let us hold fast the confession of our, our, of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Bow your heads as we pray. You are the faithful one. Faithful through the ages you have been and faithful you will continue to be. Father, thank you that even at times when we are unfaithful, Father, you remain faithful that you are a God who keeps covenant with your people. That you are a God who relentlessly pursues us. You outrageously love us. 
You jealously watch over, over us, Lord. And you are forever faithful. And Father, if we are guilty in any way of being unfaithful, if we have put our confidence in anything or anyone but you, if we have built kingdoms for ourselves and disregarded your kingdom, then, Lord, I ask that you would forgive us. And as we repent of our sin, Lord, I pray that you would draw us back and near to yourself. And, Lord, if there is anyone here today or somebody listening or watching this morning who has never surrendered their life to you, I ask that your Holy Spirit would draw them. There is no king who can save but you, Lord Jesus. And friend, if that's you, would you repent of your sin? We've all missed the mark and we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Would you seek the forgiveness of Jesus today and declare him as your king? Would you place your hand in his hand and seek from here on out to walk with him in love, obedience, surrender, and submission? And I pray, Father, that we would hold fast this hope that we have because you who have promised are faithful. And we thank you for this, King Jesus. Amen and amen. Won't you stand with me as we close in song? Yeah.
left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Yes, Lord, thank you that you are the faithful king. Lord, as we leave this place and as we go out this week, Lord, we pray that your faithfulness will go before us, Lord, and that uh, you just keep us this week, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.